All right, all right, all right. It is that time of week again. My name is Jeremy Blossom, and I am here with JC Peretz, the founder and CEO of allstarcharts.com. Welcome back to the show, JC. How are we doing? Good to be here, Jeremy. I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Uh, this has been yet another... I mean, we've got so much to talk about. These markets are giving us plenty to go back and forth with. Um, but I am so excited to sit down with you. Everybody who is joining us, thank you so much. This is going to be another amazing episode where we're going to dive into the markets, trade ideas, chart patterns, and more. You know how this show works. If you were here last week, it only works as good as the comments we get from you guys. So we can see them come in real time. Feel free to drop your questions, comments, ideas, etc., into the chat feature. Let us know where you're from. I am coming at you live from Aliso Viejo, California. What about you, JC? I am in beautiful Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Just far enough away to the city from the city that I don't have to worry that much, uh, but close enough that I can get back there quickly when I need to, hopefully soon in the future. Absolutely. So it looked like the markets, um, you know, my first question right off the bat to you, JC, is are we in store for a W? Meaning are we in store for a uh, W recovery? Meaning we're, we see this little peak here and we're gonna come right back down to the bottom see a double bottom and co from here we are the the who just came out and basically that clinical trial that gilead was working on um uh, rems desivir i don't know if, you, if i'm saying that correctly it failed and so um i know that the the markets are are closely eyeing the progress that we're making there you and i care more about the technical analysis than we do the article headlines what's your take what do you see what's going on well, so for me, you know, listen, is it going to be a V? Is it going to be a W? Is it going to be a rounding bottom? I mean, right, like we, we can go on and on on like this forever. The truth is none of us know, right? So we have to make decisions based on known uncertainty. So we know we're making the best decision we can, knowing that there are a lot of unknowns. So first of all, we have to think about why we're making these decisions and how we're making them. So now let's talk about the process. What does a V bottom look like? You know, let's just say that was it. What does that look like? Well, that looks like expansion and participation, more stocks making new highs, right? As yep. the index is making new highs. So if the S and P 500 is making new highs, we should see that new 21 day high list, the new 63 day high list expanding, getting longer, right? Th this is just basic arithmetic, the way the market works, more stocks need to go up, for stocks to go up, right? So it, as far as the <laughs> indexes go, it's, so it's uh, a sum of the parts. When the S&P 500 makes new highs, you wanna see small caps making new highs too. You wanna see Dow Jones transportation average making new highs. You wanna see maybe like the value line indexes that are more broad, equally weighted measures also making new highs, right? Those are the types of things that V bottoms look like or uptrends in general <laughs> look like, right? And and that's what, that's what that looks like. A W bottom, what does a W bottom mean? A W bottom means like, okay, fine, we bottom. Now we do nothing for a while, right? And just chop around, some stocks go up, some stocks go down. And then ultimately the indexes themselves retest those former lows. On that retest, we either get a successful retest and don't make a new low, or we slightly make a new low, right? The right part of the W, if you will, right? Second bottom. The, some of the most epic uh, uh, rallies of all time come when it slightly falls below it and then gets back above it and then you get the nasty squeeze, right? That's like the, the dream come true for traders, right? When that happens, that's a possibility. So, and by the way, on that second low, that second part of the W, when that occurs on the S&P 500 or Dow, for example, you'll have seen that most stocks will have already bottomed on the previous low. You'll get fewer stocks making new lows fewer sectors making new lows, fewer indexes around the globe making new lows on that second part of the W. That's what the W bottom would look like. Um, and I think that those are two up. Or we just break right through those lows and uh, keep keep going on down, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, that's really good insights. I knew that you were going to give us more context. I love asking you questions about indexes because a lot of people like myself oftentimes forget that there are 
what 500 or so stocks that make up the S&P 500. And so in order for that, that uh, S&P 500, what we think it's going to do, we need to look at the parts, not the sum total. And so that's a really, oh. really great way of breaking things down. Both, really. You know, yeah. we want to look at the indexes, of course. Small caps, mid caps, right? So it's a chart that I brought along with me. Can you imagine, Jeremy, I brought charts along? No way. No way. This wouldn't be a show without some charts. See, that's for sure. We got to stay on brand here, uh, Jeremy. You know, give the people <laughs> what they want, right? That's right. A hundred percent. I'll show you. Know, I'm going to go and pop this bad boy up. Here we are. All right, I got it. So what are we seeing? We are seeing... Higher highs in the S&P 500 last week, lower highs in mid caps, lower highs in small caps. So these are the types of things that we see when markets are topping, you know, whether it be a massive top or whether it be a shorter term top, in this case, a shorter term top, of course, within the context of a much bigger structural downtrend, bear market mess, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, this comes within the framework of that. Uh, because this is this chart goes back a month, right? Something like that, month and a half. So, yep. um, you know, the, the way that I see it is if you think this is a V bottom, let's just say, and the, the lows are in and we're heading higher, and this is April of 2009, if you will, um, you want to see mid caps and small caps rotating and making new highs. And so far, we have not seen that. But a week from now, Jeremy, you and I could be having a conversation and be like, yo, do you see transports? They made new highs. Small caps, mid caps made new highs. And you see the new 21-day high list. Wow. Right? Like that could totally happen. I don't think that's what's going to happen. Uh, but that that that's what would that's the conversation you and I would be having in the case that JC's wrong, which is <laughs> which is perfectly normal. I mean, I'm not here to be right. I'm here to you know, really weigh the evidence and look for good risk versus reward opportunities is really all we're doing. But that all comes within the framework of a much larger trend identification, which is what we're talking about here. The V's, the W's, you know. Yeah, we're, that these things spot the trends. And we want to be, as we mentioned, week on the winning side of these markets, right? We want to be with the masses. Uh, we do not want to be the ones that are trying to call the tops and bottoms, um, try to take advantage of the 1% of the time it'll ever happen in human history. This is might be that time away. Asymmetric risk reward ratio trades every single day. Speaking of last week, we talked about how the market was in store for a fade. We would be fading the markets, not necessarily going long. Were we right or were we wrong, JC? Do you have any, uh, you know, specific stocks that we pulled up that you could say, "Yep, we nailed this one," or "No, we were a little off on that one"? I'm trying to remember some of them, but I'd like to start doing that as we do these shows. Let's keep ourselves accountable. Are we making the right calls, or were we off, and why? Yeah, listen. Let get the the powers that be in the edit room uh, to to play Monday morning quarterback and be like, JC, what happened here? You know how how fun would that be? You know, call me yeah. out in both ways. You know, be like, you really screwed this one up royally, Jay. Or hey, nice, you know, nice call. You you got you got lucky this one time. Um, listen, I mean, uh, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about precious metals, right? Precious metals path of least resistance is higher. Gold miners just broke out to new seven-year highs. So look at the GDX. Uh, I could pull it up. Uh, just broke out the seven-year highs. The trade has been very simple. Uh, and the trade has been no trade. Uh, but the trade has been only be long if the GDX, which is the gold mining ETF, is above $31. And not be long if it is below $31. And that has actually worked out very well because it has kept us out of this choppy mess. Like, look at this chop vest. Can you see this, uh, Jeremy? Look at yeah, this I got it. Vest. Yep, I got it pulled up. I mean, oh, look how gross this is. Like, imagine being stuck in this mess. Like, this is like my worst nightmare. Like, just getting chopped up. Oh, it's like, you know, you're like, you're... Uh, uh, they they go through the, uh, the 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 initiations like in college like early on on your baseball team they just put you through torture. That's what this mess of gold miners is, right? So yeah. you know once you learn, okay, stay away from this mess, then you come and join the party, right? These people already organized the party. 
right? That's what this is. You know, they made, made the invitations. They got the balloons. They got the booze. They, they, they got everybody there. Everything necessary. The band. That's what's going on here. Here we're showing up. We're like just showing up with a glass of champagne. Like, hey, what's going on, guys? You guys, you guys been up to something? What you guys yep. been up to? Throwing a party, huh? All right, all right. You know, so that's what's going on here. So this is us now showing up to the party that all these suckers have been building for eight years, right? So this is yeah. the base, if you will. Uh, yeah. The bigger the base, the higher in space. All, all that stuff. That's this party that these people just organized, and we're showing up. You know. Maybe a little fashionably late, 10, 10 30. I don't know how you guys roll in Laguna. Um, sleepy Sonoma, California. They're in bed by 11. <laughs> right? I know, man. I'm asking this question right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add this banner. And this is basically to our audience looking at this particular uh, G here. Would you rather be in now or a year ago? Right. So like, or two years ago or three years, ago, put any time frame. you guys see the choppiness that's here and why tech analysis can help you do what? Well, we're trying to do you guys is make sure that your money is being used for the right thing at the right time. Um, if your money is just oscillating in this volatility going back and forth, back and forth, it's giving you a heart attack and it's not making you any money at the same time. Both no's, both big hard no's. So I would love to hear it. What would you guys have liked to have been? Uh, appreciate everybody coming in. I, I here from Texas and I got Evans here from Seattle, Florida. Uh, thanks for participating. Wonderful New York. Great to have you guys. Uh, so, you know, this is a big, big point. We don't just, you know, we're not here just to go and say, you know, uh, and we're not trying to play Monday morning quarterback here. This is stuff that if you follow JC long enough, he'll tell you, no, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And we'll get to a section here uh, where we're going to be talking about what he likes right now, real money making opportunities and why. And just I'll, I'm going to touch on it when he says it, but he says and approaches these in a very, very deliberate way. So um, anyway, thanks for the feedback. JC, looks like you're going to show us something else. Yeah, you know what this disgusting downtrend chart is? This is no. this is gold miners relative to the S and P five hundred. So remember that party that I said that they were uh, yeah, built. Yeah, they were we building. This is what they've been with been withstanding while all of their friends and neighbors make money being long S and P stocks. Like, why wouldn't you have been long S and P stocks if you were in gold miners instead of S and P stocks? This is what your life looks like. Just a big disappointment. You're doing all the work. And then now we're going to show up and we're going to have a kick-ass time at your party. And you just did all the work for us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, hello, like this is that. And now we're showing up right here. So the trade's very simple, Jeremy. The trade is we only want to be long if the stock is, if the index ETF in this case, GDX, is above 31. If it's not, that means the cops showed up, raided the party. We out. Yes, we don't want to be a part of it. That last graph right there it goes and shows you if you were going to have your money in the S&P 500 or you're going to have your money in GDX, this shows you that clearly the GDX was not the right call. But guess what? It's starting to show up now. That's what this is. This looks like crap. No one wants to see this in their portfolio unless, of course, you're going short. Uh, so there's this is not this is this is all yuck, right? So. This is what we are talking about when we're saying, how would you like to allocate your money? Would you want your allocate your money to the dogs, right? The one, the stocks are going to just be dragging along, going bump, but um, higher, or do you want a smooth ride? Do you want to go from zero to 60 and you're still being able to drink your cup of coffee? Or do you want to go three miles an hour and you're bumping all over the place? Um, this is exactly what we're talking about. Go ahead, JC. It looks like you're starting to break some things down. I mean, this is what this this is what this looks like to me. It looks like uh, GDX. I mean, when you look at here, when you look at the fact that we can just pull up data from any exchange anywhere in the freaking world is ridiculous, right? Um, so here we're looking at GDX relative to the S and P five hundred. So this is if you decided to right. What was it? Uh, Mark Twain. What did he say? He said that. Uh, a gold miner is a liar standing next to a hole in the ground, right? So yeah. if you if you decided to go against Mr. Twain uh, you, over the last decade, like that was just a really, really bad idea. 
But now I think that could be different because when I see this chart, man, this is what this looks like to me. Yeah. That's, what that, that's what that looks like to me. And I was reading Edwards and McGee earlier this morning because I'm a nerd with my coffee. I'm drinking a 75, I'm reading a 75 year old book on, on <laughs> technical analysis, just reading old letters written by McGee. Um, anyway, so uh, the, I was reading uh, on the chapters about like the bottom and like they call them saucer bottoms. Uh, that's what basically this is. And when you look at it on a relative basis, if this is right and we're about to break out and have an epic breakout in gold miners, which I think is exactly what's happening. We want to be, we want to be, this is a great party. This is fantastic. And I think it's just getting going. You know what I mean? Like this is like showing up to like a Vegas pool party around like noon. Like you got a ways to go. So like pace yourself. You know what yeah. I mean? That's what this is. We're getting here right at the perfect time. And I think it's really going to take off. And I think we see all time highs. And Jeremy, when gold miners are moving, I don't know if you understand this, but when gold miners are moving, they make serious moves. Like we're talking about a potential double here in gold miners. And I wouldn't even blink twice, could even be more. Uh, but those are the implications we're talking about. We're not talking about a 10% move in the IBM, right? Like this is gold miners really ripping. Look at 2016. Look at these things down in the toilet at 12, 13 bucks. They tripled in just six, six months. So that's that's characteristic of the way these things move. Uh, so yeah. a double from here, I think, should be expected uh, and should not be a surprise. And we get back up to those former highs in 2011. Oh, my God. The gold bugs are going to be freaking out. Yeah, I know. I already it's gonna, <laughs> they already they already do and they already are. I mean, you you really can't go um very many places to get news without seeing a, a headline about gold coming up, right? You've got Goldman Sachs calling for gold to increase by 50% to 3000 an ounce. Um and so we we notice the headlines, we don't trade off the headlines. We trade off of technical analysis to try to find the best risk to reward ratio opportunities we possibly can, right? So gold is a very, very big play. There's a lot of different ways you can play it. And um, so, yeah, that was one thing that we talked about last week. I, I completely concur. I think we're really still bullish uh, gold and there's like more and more uh, support in other areas and that that was the right move. So super stoked about that. We Not talked mention, about- Jeremy, you're always obsessed with the risk versus reward ratios, right? You talk about, which I, I loved about that because like, that's the most important. Who cares? I mean, not who cares, but like seriously, when it comes down to like deciding what stock to buy, like, oh, that's great. It really comes down to risk management. I mean, that's really what's important. So when, when, you, when you keep bringing this up, I really, really appreciate that. The gold miners trade, yes, I think the probabilities of success are on our side and the trend is higher. Great. But the risk versus reward is 30 to one. We're risking a buck to make 30 like that. Hello. Yeah, exactly. I, I bring it up because it's my money. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's my money. So when I'm looking to go on a trade, uh, what what do I want? Right? I I want the best opportunity without having to go and and lose my shirt in the process. Uh, who 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 doesn't want that? And so your methodology really speaks to me specifically. So I always bring it up because it's like things I ingrain in my head. Um, you know, the trader psychology is a really important one. I don't want to go into something, a pray and hope strategy, right? I want to go in there with a rock solid plan. So um, I got a question right here. Uh, let's see. I don't know if you can answer. Can you see this? Is What do you think of new gold stock? Is there a ticker symbol? Do you know that yeah, one? Yeah, it's a tiny little gold miner. We uh, can't really talk about that stuff. Um, sorry, George. We I know. It. Yeah, it's a little It's a little guy. I try to stay away from that stuff. But needless to say, if the little guys, and this is, and here's the thing about the gold miners, and you know, the, the people who are familiar with the space are chuckling right now. But the truth is, when gold miners are going, the worst, smallest little nothings are the ones that do the best, right? Like these things, Jeremy, go from like pennies to like in the teens and dollars and fortunes are made. Like it is ridiculous. And it's funny because that's, if you're in that gold mining space, like the guys in Vancouver, they love this stuff, you know? And if you've caught one of those, you got the bug. You got that, like, what did they call it? Yellow fever or whatever it is. Like when you yeah. were, you know, you caught that gold bug back in the gold rush days. 
Like that's real. That's still real today. It's really fascinating. And, you know, if you've been in the gold mining space long enough, you've had one of those home runs. Um, you know, you just want to be careful not being too obsessed looking for those and just waiting for the right times. And I think that now is one of those times, as long as GDX is above 31, I think that you go dumpster diving and you look for the biggest pieces of garbage you can find as long as you're managing your risk responsibly. You know, that that's where the uh, you know, that's where you'll find gold, if you will. <laughs> hey, yo. All right. Hey, so we're looking at gold. Look at look at this. So this is this is the stock market in the as the denominator. So this is gold as the numerator and bonds as the numerator in, in blue. So as you can see, the breakout in 2020. So this is gold and bonds just ripping versus stocks. So the question becomes, is this just the pullback and now we continue higher? That's what this chart would imply. So now gold and bonds go and outperform the S&P and this trend continues. Or, that's a picture from the Edwards and McGee book, or was that it? And now gold and bonds start out, out underperforming stocks and stocks become the leaders again. So is it like, whoops, that's lean hogs. <laughs> so <laughs> is it stocks outperforming moving forward or is it uh, gold and bonds continuing to outperform? Like that's a big question that we ask ourselves before we start, uh, you know, putting together a thesis of whether we want to be spending our time looking for stocks to buy or spending our time looking for stocks to sell. And, you know, we, we've had a good short on so far uh, by shorting small cap stocks here. Let me actually show this to you. So here we're shorting small cap stocks. This is the Russell 2000 IWM, very liquid. This was resistance in 2015, support at the end of 2018. We're fading the mid 120s in small caps all day long. If the Russell 2000 is below the late 2018 lows, we got to be short this thing all day long. Yep, I I 100% agree. Be careful, you guys. Be careful. We we're we're not in a situation where it's a clear yes we've turned the flip turned the switch there's a lot of people out there that are saying that nope we're ready we're ready we're bullish we're bullish we're bullish the train's going to keep on going could be right but not by analysis right they a clock a broken clock is, tw is right twice a day so so they say you know if you just wait long enough uh, a bull will be right or a bear will be right so gotta back it up let's talk about ge I mean, this used to be a market bellwether, right? They used to call, uh, it was one of the generals, right? GE and General Motors. And now you youngsters out there are probably laughing, be like, are you serious? Those companies used to matter? Yeah, they used to matter back in the day. The generals, GE and GM. And just look at this, a great example of relative strength. Notice how GE at top and then relative strength in, light, in lighter blue. Notice how even in the rally from 2003 to 07, we, General Electric was already underperforming the S&P 500 and then it crashed. Then on the rally off the 2009 lows, relative weakness, and then it crashed. So now look at it now, breaking down again relative to the S&P, breaking down relative to the rest of industrials, does momentum's in a bearish regime, does that mean General Electric's going to break down? And if that is the case, and General Electric does indeed follow the relative strength lower, what does that mean for the broader markets? Does it mean as much as what it used to mean? Uh, or does it not matter anymore because it's only 4% of the industrial sector when it used to be the biggest company in the world in 95 and 2000 and 05? Um, so, you know, my question is, does it still matter? My bet is it does. Yeah, I'd have to say it definitely does still matter. I would agree with that. Um, something we could miss. It was the first time in my life I've ever seen it. Um, crude oil went negative. Crude oil went negative. We, we briefly talked about energies. I believe we pulled a couple of those stocks up. Um, we were talking about not touching it, but I don't know if you've got, I'm sure you do. Can you pull up one of your, uh, you know, an energy stock and let's go into that. And, um, and maybe you can give me your opinion on this, this whole thing, because I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. So it's funny. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say funny, but uh, I have something funny to share with you um, that a, a trader from Chicago sent me. Um, whenever a trader from Chicago sends you something, <laughs> you know about that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So crude oil prices went negative. What does that mean? So here's a good explanation from a trader in Chicago. Ready? Yep. 
YW2TI crude oil traded at minus $37, negative $37. Imagine the following, right? Imagine the following. You pay $500 today and commit to receiving an escort at your house in 15 days because your wife is traveling. This is called a futures contract. Unfortunately, lockdown came and your wife will be home for the next 60 days. <laughs> you don't want this woman to show up at your house at all and try and then you try to pass this futures contract on to someone else. Only you cannot sell this commitment because nobody can receive the escort at home anymore. Everyone is in full storage with their <laughs> wife, if you will. So to make matters worse, not even the pimp, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, has more room to receive to receive girls because his house is crowded with girls. So you will pay anyone just to take the girl off your hands. Do you understand why oil has a negative price when the contract is now delivered? Yeah, that was from oil. So you can understand that concept. That's the way it was, it was explained in uh, Chicago trading floor parlance. My team, if, if you guys are watching this, let's just timestamp that, pull that whole clip. That's so good. <laughs> that's so different true. analogies to help you understand uh, basically what happened. Uh, and that's the best one I've heard so far. Yeah, I, know, I think that does do a really good job of, of trying to explain that. There's so much supply that's out there. Nobody wants to supply in future. Nobody, nobody can take it. Nobody can take true. Right? You know, nobody can take it. So then what does that mean? Um, you know, we're going to start looking at the June contracts and we'll start looking at those and we're publishing them to our customers and stuff like that. So, um, you know, just try to understand that that particular contract was put in a peculiar situation uh, where nobody could take it. You know, nobody could even want to take it. Um, so now we need to look moving forward at the future contract. And by the way, the, while 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 the, the near term contract was in the negatives, uh, all the other ones were uh, you know were, were trading at traditional prices. Yeah, right. Uh, well, that's one of the big things that happened last week. What what else were you looking at? Um, what are the things that stood out to you? I'm always interested. It with respects to. The markets, like overall, all the charts. I mean, you go into all your charts. What are the ones that stood out to you this last week? What are the things that are on your radar um, that you're following? I, I personally have been following gold really closely because we saw a little bit of a sell-off and then it kind of bounced back up a big number that you were telling us to watch. So I was all over that. Um, I was in awe of just the crude oil futures markets. I used to be a, a former commodity trader. So uh, I've been down on the CBOT several times, and I, it's the first time in my life. Uh, I don't think I don't I've never ever even heard of that happening before. Uh, so that was a huge thing that I wanted you to bring up and just talk about. I wanted to highlight some of the things that we talked about last week. You know, what were the what were our calls? Did we do good? Did we not do good? Um, and then now, what are you looking at? What are you What are you excited about, JC? Well, when I look at this, you know, when we talk about gold, we're talking about whether gold's going to go higher. And take out those 2011, 2012 highs, right? In in gold price in dollars. Well, price in euro, it's breaking out to new all-time highs. Price in yen, it's price breaking out to all-time highs. Price in Canadian dollars, price in Aussie dollars. So the trend globally in gold, I think, is up uh, very much so, in fact. And we're just seeing breakouts all over the place. Uh, so it's hard to ignore. And therefore, not only do I think that gold can get back up to those 2010, 2011 highs, but even exceed them as it has in those other currencies mentioned. And then just the resilient strength in bonds, Jeremy. I mean, if this is, if we are, if this is April of 2009, if you will, and we're, the lows are over a month back and we're just heading higher and let's rock and roll, you know, um, I, I can't imagine that bonds keep going out at new highs and they just keep hanging out at new highs. They refuse to sell off. To me, that resilient strength, even in the face of rising stock prices, I think suggests that bonds are probably going a lot lower. U.S. interest rates are going negative and the trade is very simple. Not just obviously be defensive uh, with your stock positions uh, if bonds are breaking out to new highs which we'll know if IEF is above 123. We'll, you know, if IEF is above 123, stocks are probably not doing well at all. 
Stocks are probably under serious pressure. Our IWM shorts are probably doing great. Gold's probably working out real well too in that environment. And our bond positions are probably going to be doing very well as interest rates collapse. Um, you know, and I think you got 15 points of upside in I IEF. And not just if you trade, because some people are like, JC, I'm not trading this boring bond ETF, right? Fine. If you don't want to trade the boring bond ETF, you don't have to. At least maybe use it as information to make decisions in the stock market or in the commodities market, right? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So I got you at one twenty three or above. You got a fifteen point upside potential at one twenty three or above. And just to I, rewind, yeah. this was when we were buying this in January. We put out the call uh, on the note that we send out on a weekly basis to uh, the trade stocks, right? The video that note went out when we broke out here to buy this massive base, right? By the way, now that we're mentioning this, this base reminds me a lot of that GDX, right? Remember where yeah. we just get into the party at the right time right here? That's what, what we were doing the same thing in bonds in January and that hit our target of 123, right? So as we hit that target, we faded it. Now, maybe it was gonna sell off hard, maybe it consolidated. I didn't know what it was gonna do when it hit our target. But now that we do know what it did, <laughs> we take that as constructive behavior and to me, that suggests that it's just getting ready for the next leg higher, you know, like the, the next keg is on its way. Yeah, you, you said a couple of good things there. First of all, we did talk about this. Um, I've got Michael Sparks up here. Uh, not yet. Can you make some recommendation a few companies to look into? This is for you. Uh, everybody who's just tuning in, if this is the first time you're watching this episode, uh, we are doing this live once a week where we're going into the markets. Uh, people are, are bringing real stocks that they're looking into, maybe they're invested into, and they're asking us for our feedback. And we're making real calls and real recommendations, uh, signals, I should say, about what we think is going to be happening. And so this is for you. Um, if you guys already have it, you can go to tradestocks.com and sign up for the chart of the week. It's a free newsletter that we send out and JC breaks down a specific chart just like he's doing right now and um, what he thinks happen next. And so it's up to you whether or not you want to position yourself or not. You can just use it for educational purposes. You can use it for uh, a potential opportunity that you can find. Um, it is to be noted here that trading stocks, options, futures, whatever it is, does involve risk of loss. This presentation is strictly for educational purposes, but um, you know everybody who's watching, there are resources. Of course, all charts, we'll be talking about that at the end. AllStarCharts.com is an amazing value. Uh, one of your members here, John. John says hello. He's a member from West Chester, Western Massachusetts, so he's giving you a shout out to uh, JC. Say hi to John. What's up, John? Western Mass. I want to make it up to the Berkshire soon. I've been listening to... Uh... Um, what's his face? Uh, James Taylor. He's always singing about the Berkshires and stock. What is it? Stock town, stock town. Um, real nice, by the way, Jeremy, if you ever make your way up to Western mass, uh, like no early November, the foliage is like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. You stay at a mm. hotel called the lion. What is it? The red lion Inn, which is older than this country. That's how old the damn hotel is. It's like wow. 1770s. Like you walk through the hallway and like the hallway is like slanted, you know, what I mean? <laughs> yeah. the rooms are huge. <laughs> oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah. We, got, we got Michael here from Texas. He says, what's up? Um, yeah, so that's, that's great. We, we all, we want to hear from you guys. So keep this chat, chat feature going while you're, wait, before you, I don't think you talked about that before you go into that, JC, everybody who's watching right now, go ahead and, um, put in a stock ticker symbol that you want us to take a look at. I can't promise we'll get to them all, but I'd love to um, have us in real time, break things down for you. Um, but as you post them, make sure they've got plenty of volume. We don't we don't make calls on penny stock, low float stock, stuff like that. So um, find something that you are looking forward to getting some more insights on. We'll do our best to get to it. Back to you, JC. All right, sweet. Yeah, John says he lives in the Berkshires. Nice, well, I'm coming up to visit uh, when, uh, when, when I'm allowed to anyway. Uh, I'll bring I'll bring the wine and the charts. <laughs> um, all right, so here you know we're, we're talking about gold miners breaking out, right? We're talking about gold and all these currencies around the world making new highs. Like, think just think about the words that are coming out of my mouth: breakout, new highs, seven-year highs, big base. 
you know, I, I talk to a lot of people. I give a lot of presentations. I write a lot. I read, you know, when I catch myself saying certain things like that in and of itself is a signal when I'm saying all of these things, referencing precious metals, like these are not things I've been saying about precious metals for a long time. Right. So it's just yeah, no, you really interesting that. from a, a behavioral standpoint. So if we're going to be buying uh, precious metals, you know, to me, the way I learned that if you trade the averages, you'll get average returns, right? So yes, we want to be long uh, precious metal stocks. If GDX is above 31, owning GDX is a very easy way to do that, particularly if it was a 30 to one risk reward because GDX is volatile enough. It kind of trades like a stock, right? Uh, like a normal stock just because of its volatility. But if you want to look at some individual components, that's certainly where the juice is going to be. Uh, definitely higher beta in the individual components. I like 122, one, uh, excuse me, uh, 21, uh, 22, 23 bucks. If we're above 22, 23 bucks, I think we could really be long uh, AU, which is Anglo gold. Um, and I think that we're going to 50 bucks back to those former highs. And I actually have a little treat for you, Jeremy. I, I know love, how much you like your options. from you, JC. <laughs> I know how much you oh, like your options. options. Yes. Nice. So, yup, yup, yup. So this is specifically for you, but all, all you folks at home, this comes directly from Sean, uh, our, our chief option strategist from the options desk in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Shout out Boulder. Um, and what we're doing here is we are buying the AU, Anglo Gold AU ticker symbol July 2530 bull call spread. So this means that we're going to be long the 25 calls and short an equal amount of the 30 calls for a net debit, right? So this is a defined risk trade. And the most we could lose is the debit we pay to lay out the trade, right? So this is just another way you can own the stock, you can own the option. Um, but, uh, this is just a really interesting, this July, uh, bull call spread. This comes from, uh, the expert, you know, me, I, I like to look at charts, uh, when it comes to the execution, because what happens, Jeremy, is that now Sean takes the research that we're doing. He's like, okay, JC and the fellas are into gold these days. That's cool. Okay. So they like this stock within that, or, or I should say they like a series of three or four stocks, which we do. AU being one of them. And it's just funny because that's the one that he chose based on the implied volatility of this particular stock is more favorable than the other names, right? So there's another layer of technical analysis being done in the implied volatility department, which is not my department. But what Sean is doing using his expertise and options is technical analysis. He's, he's analyzing the behavior of the market. That's what he's doing. I love it. A bull call spread. That's an amazing strategy. That's a great beginner strategy. Why do I like bull call spread so much? So here's the thing that's different. Okay. Options are a zero sum game. A lot of people don't know that you have to have a buyer for, or you have to have a seller for every buyer and vice versa. So what a bull call spread allows us to do is it defines our risk. We can't lose what more than the amount that we paid for that bull call spread. And also by incorporating bull call spread, we are getting a discount. Because we're selling an option, we're taking that credit, we're applying it towards our debit, which is knocking off the price. And you only the 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 cons of a bull call spread is that if you if the if the call here is that it could go from 23 to 50, you're gonna stop making money after 30, right? Wherever you sold that call, it's a defined amount of profit. But the risk reward ratio is still great. You have a defined risk, which is great when it comes to options. Uh so love it. Great job, Sean. Um JC, what a surprise. What a, uh, that meant a lot to me. Uh, for those of you, those who don't know me, I've been trading options for a long time. I love options. Uh, so that was really fun and that was awesome. So what else do you got for us? Well, I just want to reiterate a couple of things quickly that we, when you talk about the risk management, the most we could lose is the debit. That's like the worst case scenario. Like the world ends tomorrow. That's still the most we could lose, right? Yeah, but we right. like to add, you know, Sean's really, really good with best practices. We like to add another layer of risk management. And if AU breaks below 20, we're out, right? So all bets are off. We're not going to let it go all the way to zero. We're going to like take what we can get at that point if we're below 20 bucks in AU. So that's risk management number one. Risk management number two, whenever we double, Right. So whenever we like double the price at this point, 
uh, the the spread, the most it could be worth is five bucks, which is the difference between the long strike and the short strike, right? So we'll look to take profits, you know, somewhere around three and a half. That would represent a little bit more than 50% of the maximum profit. So we want to take our profits there uh, on the debit and just, uh, I think that uh, the risk management to both when you're right and when you're wrong, uh, I think is really, really important. So that 20 level. So I just wanted to reiterate that there are multiple layers uh, of risk management involved. I love that. The between and first and foremost, the, the, the hard, heavy lifting as far as looking overall trends of the marketplace. Um, he's doing the hard lifting when it comes to there's a million different ways to play the options markets. He's doing what is the right play and why so for combination and, and that's a great explanation um we got some people i i, I don't know if you oh yes yeah, you do let's talk about the dow jones transportation average go for it i think you have to right you 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 dance with the girl who brought you to the dance right what is it you right that you dance with the girl that brought you there right yes right correct yep you dance with the girl who brought you there yeah something like that maybe somebody can throw it in the comments with the exact something like <laughs> that well, too young to know what the exact quote is. Anyway, yeah, that's an but, old school one. That's old school, yeah. right? Um, but that's just the truth in the market, right? So what got us so bearish at the end of January and early February? Small caps were rolling over, making new relative lows, making new lows, not making new highs like the S&P and the Dow and the NASDAQ. What else was giving us a good indication? transports transports weren't making new highs either and we're also breaking down on a relative basis so if small caps and transports were two great indications that we should get the heck out of the way um i think that's something to pay attention to so let's look at transports and what information are they providing listen if they're going to get us out of this mess uh they're certainly not showing any effort that it's going to be happening anytime soon right you know, that, that that party that's been being organized by the gold bugs for the past decade, like that organization hasn't even started yet. You know, they haven't even started sending out invitations yet. Like there's just no reason to be involved in this mess. Uh, I think there are better, more exciting places to be with way less risk, you know. Uh, and this is just a great example of what got us bearish is still, you know, <laughs> you know not looking good. You know, going back, just to give you an example of what a great indicator this has been, not just from the downside, but let me just pull. Look at this. So just so you can see, number one, in 2014, you could pull up the Dow. Isn't it great? We have the technology to do all this. Look how fast I could pull up like any index I want. In the world. Yeah, this is, yep. And not just this software, but like a million other softwares, right? So you could see here, this is in, so the blue the blue line is the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the black line is the transports. Notice how the transports at the end of 2014 peaked and the Dow Industrials kept making new highs, right? Right, you see that divergence? Now yep. look here, now look here. In 2016, the Dow Jones Industrial Average made new lows. Transports were already putting in higher lows. And boom, massive rallies, right? When the transports were giving us a heads up that something was wrong, the S&P 500, the Dow, all of them collapsed, right? Huge downtrends for the next year, basically, right? And then in January, uh, the transports bottomed. And then when the industrials made their new lows, the W, if you will, to take everything full circle, right? Nice. Notice how on the W, we slightly undercut the prior January low. And then, like I said, a bunch of uh, uh, stocks had already made their lows. In this case, transports exhibit A. And then wait, 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 wait. before you go forward, before you go forward, go back just to the W sign real quick uh, right there. Okay. So look, guys. So how many of you look for signals? How many of you are using uh, MACD, <laughs> uh, stochastics and things like that to go and find your breakout signal? Here's the difference between a CMT, a chartered market technician with years of experience. That's your signal. He's drawing the line right there. Okay. When you see the divergence of the two, uh oh, something's not right. Something's going to happen when these two things aren't doing the right things at the right time. 
This is the type of stuff that JC is looking for. This is the type of stuff that he goes and comes up with with his trade recommendations and his trade signals based off of this. Okay. These aren't article headlines that come and flash above the screen. He's like, okay, everybody should go along this or short that. This is a one of these things where you've got to be a trained expert. You got to be able to know what you're looking for. You got to have the time to do the research to find it. And JC provides this to everybody who's a member. And uh, this is a beautiful demonstration, absolutely perfect demonstration of when there's th- this is the signal when something doesn't look right, when something d- diverges. There, there you go. Wu Tang. <laughs> That's the W. That's the W bottom. <laughs> yeah, the Wu Tang. Yes, there it is. Absolutely. There's that w. There's a W. So great. That's a, that was a fantastic, that's a fantastic chart, a fantastic example of a trade signal um, that experts find. So I just wanted to up everybody watching. So then here, what are we seeing? Yeah. So at the top, we're looking at the transports and at the bottom, look at the industrials. Notice how the transports never made new highs coming into this year as the industrials did. And even at the end, the very, even the last, very last high, transports put in another lower high, just like the icing on the cake, the cherry on top, and then the complete collapse. So what happened here? Both of them made new lows. Now, last week, the industrials made new highs, transports did not. So that's the first divergence that we've seen, negative or positive. That's right. And it's just that subtle difference, folks, of that bottom blue chart. If you guys notice, it's trending upwards before it falls off. The top black line is not. It's going straight to coming down. It's a very subtle disparity, but this is happening over time. And when one is going up and one is not, there you go. We see that there's going to be a change. So um, that's a really, really important distinction. And this is exactly what you need to be looking out for when you're watching things. It's Look, guys, the world is absolutely connected. Okay. Um, all of these different sectors are all di- connected with one another. It is your ability to understand how they're connected and when they're not. And when they're not connected is when there's usually an opportunity to make money. By buying the S and P and the Dow right now, I think you're like you're somewhere in here. I mean, you're somewhere over here somewhere. I think in by buying the transports uh, and the Dow, just stocks, U.S. stocks in general. Um, I think that's where you are. And I think at the very best, you got a mess ahead of you you know, with, you know, you got work to do, you know, I don't, I don't think that this is this, you know, a lot of people are betting. A lot of people are betting that we're here. Right. Yeah. So this is the transportation index, by the way, notice how in 2007 and 2008 transports were making new highs in 2008 and industrials were nowhere to be found. So like these divergences just, you know, again and again and again, um you know so you know people are betting that we're right here you see this area right here you know right around um you know may of 2009 you know that this is the beginning so is that the bet that we're making no this is not the bet that we're making our bet is that we're somewhere back here unless so until proven otherwise until proven otherwise if we get breakouts in new highs like for example look like until we get breakouts in this very simple very simple Right. We get breakouts yeah. in the new 10 day high list. Like just look, even short term breath with new highs in the S&P 500, fewer stocks were making new 10 day highs. Only a fraction of the amount that were making new 10 day highs a couple of weeks ago. Right. So if we get expansion, if we get a big bar and a huge spike in new 10 day highs comes out. I'll be like, Jeremy, you know, all right, now we're talking. But that's just not what we're seeing. We're seeing that sort of action in bonds and gold miners. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying there, and I think that you know that was a great, great point that we can make a change at any time. Um, the the a, a sad thing that we see a lot of traders do is get married to an idea. They get married to the uh, stock, um, and you can't be right. This is a big dating scene. This is like going to the bar every single night. You walk into your first bar, first person you see, you get married to them. You mean, that's a long road if you're going to keep going in and out of bars for the rest of your life, right? That's how trading works. So you need to make sure that you are nimble enough, flexible in your thinking and in your analysis to make changes and know when you're going to be wrong. So that's one big point. Second big point is, is let me ask you guys who are watching right now, 
Would you want your money tied up if you know there's a crap coming your way? Would you want your money into a stock that's just going to go up and down pretty much sideways in a volatile manner for the next three to six months? Or would you rather get smart with it and find opportunities where your money's going to make money for you? Of course, you're going to want the latter. So that's a that's a big thing to think about. What we're trying to say, hey, in our opinion, I probably wouldn't put my money there or I wouldn't put my money here because it doesn't look right. It's just messy. When opportunities out there that look phenomenal, that look really, really good, those are the ones that we want to go and get ourselves into and find. So we're removing ones, the ones that the market herd mentality kind of goes towards, meaning like your cool average article trader binds and we're a couple layers deeper and finding the ones that experts look at the ones that experts get excited about um, so we got some questions here let's go into um let's go into this one and then i want to uh, answer some of these questions they got going over here jc well i see here that thomas is curious on uh, intel um mm -hmm. you know for me whenever in doubt zoom out um so i'm looking at you know intel running into this potential you know, area of resistance, right? You know, right into the mid seventies. These are the 2000 highs, the epic highs from 2000. We're right below them. So can you chop up a trade here? Sure. Like, um, you know, we could take a look at the, the shorter term chart, but what you're going to see is, right? What you're going to see is, you know, this is a sideways range, right? For sure, a sideways range, but it comes within the context of overhead supply. So we're in a sideways range. Whoops. So we're in a sideways range in Intel, uh, excuse me, uh, in Intel in the short term, right? And then bigger picture, even if this does resolve higher, like how much higher can it go before it runs into the March uh, 2000 highs? And if we make it a weekly chart, you know, just to, to really show you, I mean, look how close we are on a weekly basis. I mean, we're right there. So to me, you know, it's not worth the trouble. You know, I feel like there's cleaner places to be. Like, you know, when we looked at gold miners, notice how gold miners are now breaking out of here, right? As Intel is running into it. See the difference? Yeah. You, know, yep. um, you know, this is a timing thing. This is a timing thing, Thomas. I, I would 100% agree with that. Um, it's something that you can put on your watch list and continue to go and monitor. But are you going to put your money to work? It, you know, it, it's a risk. It's a, that's when we start to get into these these scenarios where you're risking a lot to just get to go into a potential headwind here. So if you went in now and let's say it's going to go up to that support line or that resistance line, which is uh, which is out there, which is highlighted right now, would you would you want to do that? Why not wait until we get the validation like we're seeing in in gold? Uh, why not wait? So you got some more uh, stuff you're going to go into. Yeah, this is just another example of the same thing. Just wait, exactly what we're saying. This is financials. Sure, financials could have broken out finally after 13 years, but they did not. If you would have just waited, you would have avoided this mess. You know, so uh, in gold miners, we've been so, we've been paid so much to not be in this market, like just the opportunity cost that we've avoided by not being in gold miners. But now we can. We're happy. We're, this is, we got what we've been waiting for. Maybe it took longer than some of us expected, but. We got it finally. So now with Intel, you know, with financial, same thing. One day we'll get it, but we haven't gotten it and patience has paid. Same thing with Intel. One day maybe we'll get it. And when that day comes, we'll buy it. Why not? Yeah, why not? But it's it's because there's not, you don't have an infinite, maybe, maybe Thomas does, but I, he's got an amount of cap. You could just get all the amount of risk on. We treat this capital as working as strong and as smart as possible. Um, all right, so you got these questions that you see down here. Do you got any one of yeah. them you wanna dive into? Yeah, um, John's talking about the MACD. Uh, he doesn't like the divergence. I don't use a MACD. I know really smart people uh, who do. I use a 14 period RSI. You know, that's me. I've been using it for a long time. I know it very, very well. I've been watching this thing trade for a long time. And if you go to allstarcharge.com slash momentum, I lay out exactly how I use my momentum indicator. I know smart people who use MACD. Um, I, I'm not against it. If there's going to be a second momentum indicator that I would use, I would use that. Um, I don't really use stochastics. I don't really understand it, to be honest with you. There's the slow one, the fast one. 
I don't really get it. Uh, so it's not for me. ROC, everybody has a momentum indicator. I'm a 14 period RSI guy through and through. Love it. I hope that answers the question, John. We're asking about uh, 10 day high list as an indicator. You know, for us, we just run it. We have an algorithm uh, that we build, we, we code it. We have like a zillion of them, a zillion algorithms uh, that give us all sorts of data, sectors. Like we get the, the, the amount of sectors making new 10 day highs. Like, and we have two lists of sectors. We have like just the basic 11. Then we got the longer one that's got the sub industry groups. We have all the countries in the world, both in local currencies and in uh, and dollar denominated as well. And we run those scans there. So we get 10 day highs, uh, 21 day highs, 63 day highs. When it matters, 52 week highs right now, the 50, you know, looking at the 52 week high list is like looking at the snow report in the middle of summer. You know, it's just nothing much going on over there. <laughs> you know, so we're looking at different lists. You know, in the fall, we were we weren't we didn't really care that much about the 10 day high list. We were more concerned with uh, the 52 week high list, the all time high list. You know, we're having <laughs> baby steps We're we're, you know, we talk about all time highs. We're talking about 10 day highs here. Um, and I wanted to show you. A really interesting one. Did I have this here? And John, why he's pulling that up. Um, if, if this is a great reason why you should be a member of allstarcharts.com because you get the result of those algorithms. He's able to, uh, and maybe you are, and that'd be great if you are. But those of you who are not, by becoming a member of All Star Charts, this is how you guys can get this information is that he has these algorithms that he runs and then he goes and distills the information and breaks it down for you in the conference calls and the trade signals. It's all on the all-star charts membership. So here's a great indicator. And speaking of algorithms, like this one's awesome. Like my, I'm not like, I'm not the coder full disclosure. Like I got younger, uh, brighter minds that build it for me. I just design what I want and then they figure out the code. Like these guys are awesome. Straza shout out Bruni. So here we're looking at the percentage of stocks in the s p 500 that are above their anchored vwap from february 19th how about that for a mouthful <laughs> jc what does this mean right so what this means is what is an anchored vwap an anchored vwap is the moving averages there's no price history in moving averages an invisible line but when it comes to volume weighted average price that is the average price that has been transacted since a specific date we are choosing the high close for the S&P 500 in this particular case. We anchor it to other dates too. But for the purposes of this conversation, this works because since the peak is the average market participant up or down, right? And uh, right now we're getting 36% reading. So the average market participant in the S&P 500 is losing. And with the S&P 500 making new highs last week, we got more losing taking place on average. So breath deterioration using anchored VWAP statistics. This has never been done ever in the history of the United States or any stock market. This is not anything that's been done because we've never had the tools to be able to do such a thing. Now it takes us, uh, I don't know, 12 seconds, 13 seconds, uh, depending on how fast our uh, internet speed is to calculate these things from any specific date. Are you pulling something up right now? Am I supposed to be seeing something? Oh shoot! You guys aren't seeing this. My fault. Sorry. I'm like, I'm like, I, I can see your head moving to your second screen. I'm like, I, oh, I hold know. on, hold on. My bad, guys. My bad. This is a great chart. Oh man, totally my fault. Um, here, hold on. Um, here you go. There it is. I got you. All here right. What, this is what we're seeing. So here on top here is the S&P 500. The blue line is the anchored VWAP from the February 19th close, which was the high close for the S&P 500 before the crash. And then down here, the histogram is the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 that are above their specific anchored VWAP from that date. Right. And notice how with higher highs in the S&P, Fewer stocks are above their anchored VWAP, showing that the average market participant is losing, not winning. Uh, and that was really the point that I wanted to make. And this analysis has never been done uh, before. And then just notice here, I want to show going back, not just so the 10 day highs are potentially a great indicator of breath weakening now, but also in February, notice how with higher S&Ps, fewer 10 day highs, right? So these divergences in breath you know, to me, there's a lot of different ways to analyze it. Um, 
they all say the same thing, right? Whether it's 10 day highs, whether it's sectors making new highs, you know, whatever it is, when these divergences start adding up, you know, if you ignore it, um, you know, I think it's foolish because we have the data, we have the capability like to ignore it. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Um, that's so cool that you're doing that. Uh, I, I have like a million questions. We're going to have to do a separate, uh, <laughs> I, I, we don't have time. I want to go next week. I'm going to come at you with some questions on that because first of all, it's freaking genius that you would even want to try to find that data. So a lot of my questions are on how that thought process came about and how that was actually being able to rep be represented because that does seem like one of the most powerful statistics to, to know. So I love it. Let's go over two more. I'd like to see Zoom, if we could, for Jeff. And because we talked about this last week, we'll hit the QQQ again. Uh, sorry for everybody else. Um, I know that uh, you guys put some other ticker symbols in there. Come back next week. We're here every single week, same time, same place, right after the, the closing bell. JC and I are breaking down what happened in the stock market and your favorite stocks. We'll go over in real time. So let's go over while you're pulling that up. I'm actually going to also pull up um, something for everybody. So before you jump into that, um, everybody, you know, this we're, we're here today because um, we care about care about how everybody's getting affected by this pandemic. Uh, you know, some of you may know people who've gotten sick or maybe you've lost businesses. Um, it's it's a huge tragedy. Uh, this is completely unprecedented times. So the 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 title for this series is COVID Market Watch, where we're just going and talking about stuff. But um, and I love, by the way, John, I'm loving that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. John is a client of yours. I know that several of you are already members of allstarcharts.com. Um, for those of you who are not members of allstarcharts.com, here's a link uh, for a special that you guys can take advantage of. Uh, this is just for new members. Uh, and this is a great way for you to get acclimated to all-star charts. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. So meaning it's completely risk-free, uh, check out that link. Um, there's a special, like I said, first time member discount that's listed there and, and JC, I put it in the comment section. And so we do this because, uh, we're here to help. JC's here to help. I don't own all-star charts. I'm a part of tradestocks.com. We have a collaboration together where uh, we're friends. JC and I have known each other for a while. He is probably one of the smartest guys I know. Absolutely a straight shooter. And those of you who've been clients of JC's for a while, tell us about how your experience has been. Do you love JC? Do you love all-star charts? Put it in the comments below so people can you know, hear what it's like to actually be a member. Um, we're all about providing real actionable advice, finding asymmetric risk reward ratios using the power of technical analysis. So go ahead, check out that, uh, that link join. And, um, yeah, this is, I mean, look, this is, this is literally unsolicited. Okay. Uh, talk about this. Do you see this JC? I put up on the screen, all star yeah. charts, I mean, out of stocks before the big February drop. I mean, like that's uh that warm that that's exactly the point of this, guys. And now is JC gonna be right hundred percent of the time? Absolutely not. Um, he is he's definitely been wrong and he'll be wrong again. That's not the point of this. The point of this is that he's got a proven methodology where more often than not, he's gonna make the right decision. And so, John, thank you for commenting on that. Yeah, but kudos I to John. I mean, listen, I, I could talk, I could put up all the charts I want. You know, the, the the credit goes to the investor, goes to the trader. I agree. You know, John, obviously, is who we're talking about now, but investors were all over the place. Number one, take the credit. I'm not, I didn't do anything. I just provided a, a few ideas and then you pulled the trigger. Good for you. Uh, but it works the other way too, right? When uh, you lose money, it's not the Fed's fault. It's not the Trump's fault. It's not the TV's fault. It's your fault. It's nobody else's fault but yourself. So you 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 own it uh, both ways for sure. All we're doing is just geeking out with data uh, because that's what me and the team love to do. So if that can just help you make wiser decisions, you know, awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love it. 
Best stock charting service, hands down. John's a big fan. We're a big fan of you, John. Appreciate Thank you, John. For, the, for the love and the kudos. All right, what do you got here, man? Zoom, let's talk about it. You guys want to talk about Zoom? Big shocker. Everybody seems to want to talk about Zoom. And then why do people want to talk about Zoom? Because it's working. You know that new 52-week high list that I told you was lonely? Well, Zoom is sitting there, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a unicycle, just spinning around in circles by itself, basically. Um, sitting here at the new all-time high list, I mean, to me, that's impressive in and of itself. We looked at all these other charts that look terrible. GE flirting with 27-year lows and like, you know what I mean? Zoom uh, is just not that, right? Zoom is making new highs. So that strength, look at the relative strength, positive momentum. The trade has been simple. If we're above 137, you know, we want to be long Zoom. Uh, with a target of 183, but realistic, this this baby can go to 260. Uh, so there's a lot of upside here, big base, um, not to get all fundamental on you, but it seems everybody around the world, my mom's like, I started using Zoom last week. Have you heard of it? <laughs> That's mom. We've been using Zoom for a long time. And what about Slack? You use Slack too? Yes. Uh, She's like, I, I got to figure this Slack out, they tell me. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, you know that something's something big is happening when we get our parents using some type of technology that uh, we've been using for a long time. And look, you know, we're gonna be we're all gonna be hunkered down for a while. Um, and this is, I think, a lot of companies have seen ways that they can adapt their entire business models to use technology like Zoom. And kudos to Zoom. I know that they went through some privacy issues and some slack, you know, uh, on that whole front. But you guys, everybody who is using it, their system works. It's reliable and um, pe businesses are relying on it. Anytime you can get uh, built into a big business's processes, you're going to be here for a while and you're going to be used in big, big ways. So um, I like it. Great. And then let's go one more. Let's do the QQQ. The QQQs. I'm old enough to remember when they used to be four Qs for you youngsters out there. I remember that too. I you know why they had to change it? No, I don't. Oh my God. The reason they had to change it was because there are certain investors around the world that have certain accents. So they would always be talking about 4Q, 4Q, 4Q. Oh, no way. I don't know. I doubt that's the reason, but I always thought um, it was. <laughs> I'm all like, wow, that's I totally see that. But yeah. that's also a really funny joke. It's a good chart, <laughs> good, good stock joke right there. Um, all right. So then what are we looking at? So we're looking at the cues. Let me let's go back in time and you know, um let's go back in time to ancient times. Um when this is directly from the blog. And what, it, what was going on here, Jeremy? What does it say? It says, ancient mathematics says sell stocks February the 1st. Can you imagine how much mockery I received after that uh, headline? Um, That's a bold yeah. headline. That's a bold headline, especially I know your friends. They probably... <laughs> They're harsh, man. They're like, oh, there's JC with his rabbit multiplication math. I mean, they're just like busting my chops. Uh, so this is what date? This is, uh, what, what did we say? This was on uh, February the 1st. Yeah, Feb 1st. Feb 1st. And what are we seeing? We're seeing exactly the 161.8% extension of the entire top to bottom uh, tech bubble decline. We finally got back up there, consolidated, and reached that next target. All right. Anybody who knows me knows that I've been pounding the table, buying tech, you know, forever. Well, guess what? Mission accomplished. See ya. Now it's somebody else's problem was basically our, our thought process at the time. Like we had a risk versus reward. Our targets were hit. Peace out. Now it's not our problem anymore. Right. And that was a sense. I didn't know it was going to crash. I mean, we had other indications, obviously, that we've discussed telling us to get out and, and start shorting and buy bonds. But even without all those things, our targets were hit. See ya. Um, no reason to be involved. Uh, and then we know what happened from there, obviously. Um, just completely collapsed from there. Um, but now it's, you know, it's 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 messy, you know? It's really yeah. messy. I mean, okay. it, it's definitely the stronger of all the indexes in the world. It's definitely one of the strongest ones, right? 
So in terms of the retracements, if you look at um, if you look at something like small caps, for example, small caps had nowhere near the retracement that the Nasdaq did. Whoops. See, watch. So up at top, we have the NASDAQ retracing 61.8% or even more so. And then we've got the Russell 2000, nowhere near the 61.8% retracement, actually failing at the 38.2% retracement. So you see how much stronger the bounce was in the large cap uh, in, in the queues, right? When in the small cap, right? We yep. only retrace a fraction of that. That yep. is the relative weakness. That is the characteristic of a dead cat bounce. That is why we're shorting small caps and not the NASDAQ, right? You see what I'm saying? Like yeah, they say, right. don't, don't kick someone when they're down, but that's actually the best time to kick them when they're already down. And, and that's what we want to do uh, with small caps, uh, kick them when they're down. I think we ended last week with the same exact message, kick people when they're down. So that message is continuing again. So, but, but great distinction there. I do want to highlight that there is a big distinction between, okay, the big market versus what you could be shorting small cap. And, and there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can approach it. Uh, this just takes a little bit of savviness from you as an investor to make sure that you're not just looking at one thing, one way, and you're diving a little bit deeper and you're finding other opportunities beneath the layers. The stock market's a big, big, big place, boys and girls. There are lots of opportunities and a lot of traps. Make sure you're staying safe out there, avoiding the traps, not getting too greedy, um, and not letting fear interrupt that there is absolutely some opportunities to make money in these markets. We've covered that. So we answered those questions. And when in doubt, kick somebody when they're already down. Right? Yeah. Sell, the stuff, sell the stuff nobody wants. Yeah, exactly. Right? Do it. All right, JC, you're a gentleman and a scholar. It is always... Always an honor to have you here on the show. We're going to be back again next Thursday. I'm super excited about it. Everybody, if you're watching this and this wasn't live, add your comments. Everybody who's online right now, give us a like, give us a thumbs up. Uh, let us know how we did and how we can make this show better. I really appreciate your time, JC. I'll catch you guys all later. Manage risk. Easy come, easy go. Yeah. Right? Your, your worst trade ever is going to come right after your best trade. So be careful. I love it. That is a valuable lesson. That's a valuable lesson. Thank you so much, JC. Everyone be safe out there. Have a great week. We'll see you next Thursday.